I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. All right, I get a nod from Dr. Duncan. So everybody, welcome. Welcome to 2021, right? And our webinar series today. We're super excited to have you here. Um, and with a new year, 2021 comes new sponsors, actually. So we always wanna make sure we start and thank our sponsors, which would be Biogen, um, Spark, and Santin are, will be our 2021 sponsors for all of our webinars. So we just want to say a, just a great thanks to them. Uh, as everyone already knows, and it's like an old record, we are using the webinar feature, which means you get to use the chat button. So my job as host would be to monitor the chat. Um, if appropriate, and uh, Dr. Duncan takes a you know break or pauses during her uh, presentation, I might jump in. Otherwise, I'll make sure that we get to your questions at the end. All right, so all that to say, we'll get to the good stuff next. Um, Dr. Duncan is um, a prize gem, if I can say that, to the Choroideremia Research Foundation. Oh, you are. Um, you have been a part of our organization for a long time. So just for those of you that don't know Dr. Duncan, she is from the University of California, uh, San Francisco, and she both diagnoses and treats patients, which is sometimes a rare thing, but she does both. And she's involved in lots of IRD research programs. Um, and IRDs are inherited retinal diseases. She's in, uh, a part of a lot of research, both at the FFB and with the Choroideremia Research Foundation. You sit right on our SAB, and I believe you're the chair, or you were the previous chair of, no, the, the FFB. Yes. yes, there we go. The <laughs> that one I am, yes. Yes, so that means she comes with a lot of really superior information um, and she's the perfect person to tell us a little bit about gene therapy. So I wanna make sure that we cross this bridge right now, folks. Dr. Duncan can't tell us really specifically about the three trials that are going on for choroideremia. You know, she can tell us about what gene therapy is and how there are some benefits, maybe some considerations, um, but she really can't give us specifics on the three that we're, uh, we're going through right now. So I just want to make sure I got that one covered at the beginning. Uh, but I think that's it. Um, I'm going to stop my camera. I'll field the questions and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Great. Well, gosh, thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I will start sharing my screen but I might need you guys to make sure that I'm sharing the one I wanna share. So give me one second. I think I wanna share this one, share. And do you see my first slide? Gene Therapy 101? We sure do. Oh, perfect. Okay, just checking on, making sure technical difficulties are all, are all uh, addressed before we proceed. Good. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to talk today a little bit about gene therapy. And again, 101 means the entry level talk. Don't um, expect this to be the most comprehensive review of gene therapy in the world, but hopefully it will address some common questions and lead to further discussion. I do have a number of uh, financial disclosures to report. I work with a number of companies to give them advice about clinical trial design. I also serve on the Data Safety Monitoring Committee for a number of clinical trials. And I receive funding from some entities to run clinical trials and from other organizations for my role on the um, Scientific Advisory Board. And uh, as, as Beth mentioned, for Foundation Fighting Blindness, I received both funding for grants as well as um, service as a, as a scientific advisor. Okay, with that being said, and some actually of the companies uh, listed on this slide are conducting clinical trials in Corderamia. So there is some overlap between funding sources and my talk today, just to get that out of the way. Okay, so gene therapy. 
uh, it sounds really futuristic. And it sounds like if these are inherited, if we're talking today about inherited retinal degenerations, um, gene therapy, this has timing on it, gene therapy, sorry, let me see if I can fix that. Hold on one sec, one sec, I'm sorry, one second. Let me get rid of that and that and that. Try that again, perfect. Okay, now we can go at our own pace. Um, gene therapy is to correct a genetic mutation that causes vision loss. So you would think if you could just fix the genetic defect, you could fix the problem, right? That seems like it would be an easy solution to an inherited retinal degeneration, but it is not as straightforward as one might wish uh, because DNA is hard to change in cells that don't divide. And that's on purpose because usually if the DNA in a cell changes, you have a there's a risk of potentially causing problems like cancer or other kinds of tumors. So we usually don't want to change DNA and the body has a number of mechanisms in place to try and prevent that from, from happening. Um, so we, we want to try, but we would like to try and introduce changes in the DNA that will permanently change the way the cells make proteins. And so a number of companies and other investigators are working on new strategies to try and change the DNA in ways to precisely affect the genes that cause disease without causing any other problems. So we're going to talk about some of those challenges and potential solutions today. The way you would want to treat an inherited retinal degeneration is determined, at least in part, by the mechanism of disease. So for people who have autosomal recessive or X-linked recessive diseases, you could envision an approach where you augment the uh, defective gene. You either replace the missing gene with a normal copy, uh, with a copy that works, or if there's a changed gene, you put in an unchanged, more uh, normal sequence copy. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one example where this approach was effective and safe and led to FDA approval of a different disease just to show that that really paved the way for a lot of people being interested in developing gene augmentation treatments for inherited retinal degenerations. Another approach that might be more effective for certain kinds of genetic mutations, either very large genes that are not easy to deliver to cells or ones that introduce specific kinds of changes that if you could just get past them would not cause problems is called gene skipping. You might be able to skip over the mutation. And that might be possible not by permanently changing the DNA, but by introducing a special kind of molecule called an antisense oligonucleotide. So we'll talk a little bit about that today as well. And then finally, another approach might be to edit the gene, not replace a missing gene, but to tweak the DNA that's there in a way that removes the, mis the abnormal sequence or corrects it to a, a sequence that doesn't cause problems. And um, that's a, likely to be effective for genes that cause autosomal dominant disease where you have two copies, one is already normal and there, but that's not enough to cause normal vision. Or if there are very big genes or for any number of other reasons, autosomal recessive genes that aren't really very easily delivered using the approaches that have been helpful for other kinds of, of treatment, of other genetic diseases. So I'm going to give you, again, now this is very early, a little, uh, very high level introduction to gene therapy. And these slides were created by my colleague, Christine Kay, who is a ret an expert and a vitro-retinal surgeon um, with expertise in inherited retinal degeneration. So she organizes a course for ophthalmologists all around the country um, every year at the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And she shared with me these slides, which are so wonderful that I just wanted to modify them slightly and share them with you. Um, so as I mentioned before, different Different diseases probably require different gene genetic approaches. Recessive diseases require augmentation or replacement where you can put in a normal or better working copy um, of the gene that is causing problems. Dominant diseases require a more sophisticated approach where you either reduce the uh, impact of the abnormal gene by suppressing or inactivating it, or by, as I mentioned before, tweaking the DNA a little, editing it with a CRISPR-Cas9 approach. 
Um, there are also some diseases that are not so uh, genetically straightforward, like multifactorial diseases that also might be a treatable, might be treatable with gene therapy. So for example, um, patients who have age-related macular degeneration do not have a specific gene that is responsible for that disease. However, gene therapy might be helpful for people with those kinds of diseases, either by delivering a protein that would keep their cells alive longer, like a growth factor, and that type of approach is in clinical trials right now. Um, that's being used for people with the dry form of AMD. Then there's also delivery of treatments that might slow down the growth of abnormal blood vessels for the wet form of AMD. So both of those gene therapy approaches are being used not just for inherited retinal diseases, but for even more common diseases that are not known to be caused by a single genetic mutation. And then we also are, it is possible to use gene therapy to deliver proteins that don't care what kind of genetic mutation is causing the vision problem. And so these are, these might be helpful approaches for long-term delivery of proteins that keep the cells alive longer. For example, neuroprotective proteins, like a protein called rod-derived cone viability factor, which may be delivered with gene therapy to keep the cells alive on a long-term basis, regardless of the genetic cause of the vision loss. There also is the opportunity to use gene therapy to deliver proteins that might affect, might cause inner retinal cells to become light sensitive. In general, when the retina degenerates caused, uh, due to an inherited retinal disease, the cells that are affected are the vision cells, the rods and the cones. So if you, those are the cells that respond to light. So if you could make the other cells in the retina that don't get affected by the inherited retinal degeneration become sensitive to light, you might be able to restore some sight. And so that is an approach called optogenetics. And so you can also use gene therapy to deliver optogenetic approaches that might make the inner retina respond to light in people who have very advanced vision loss. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of how you deliver gene therapy. Uh, so genome, genetic material is known as Gene is part of the genome. And if you wanna deliver a gene of interest, we would call that a transgene. So that's delivering a therapeutic gene that might be needed to keep the vision cells alive. A promoter is part of the genome that drives the expression of that gene. So it's a part of D the DNA that doesn't turn into protein itself, but it turns on the expression of the DNA you're interested in. And you can use, you can design a gene therapy such that the promoter is only active in certain cells. And this helps you deliver the, the genes specifically to the kinds of tissues that are most affected by the genetic mutation. In this case, maybe the photoreceptors, or in some cases, it's the retinal pigment epithelial cells. You can target the cells that you want to have express that gene using the promoter. And then the vector is the package that causes the DNA to get into the cell and turn on protein production. So we like to, so there's lots of different ways of doing it. You might be able to just deliver bare DNA to a cell, or you could use a special little tiny particle called a nanoparticle to get into a cell. Or more commonly, you could use a special virus. So viruses are really good at getting into cells and co-opting the DNA in the cell to make more copies of themselves. That's how viruses have survived throughout evolution. Um, and there's a couple of different viruses that we can use that might be less likely to cause disease or sickness, which viruses usually intend to do or inclined to do. Um, but instead, we use that same mechanism or that same machinery to turn on production of our gene that we're interested in. For example, the corduremia gene. Um, so here is a way, the way we want to deliver this gene is with, uh, first of all, the most important thing for gene therapy is to have accurate genetic characterization of why the person's losing vision. So genetic testing is really important to know what the gene that is affected and is the cause of disease is in a given person. If you don't know what the genetic mutation is, you can't uh, target it or treat it effectively with gene therapy. So, but once you know which gen gene is responsible, then we can think about gene augmentation or gene replacement or gene therapy as a possible treatment for that patient. Um, and again, most commonly we use viruses to carry the gene of interest into 
the cell that we're targeting. Um, once it gets into the nucleus of the cell that we want to want to treat, then that cell starts turning on the production of whatever gene we have put into the uh, the viral vector. Um, and we're going to talk. Uh, the, apparently, the first I learned this in preparing for this talk. The first FDA approved gene therapy in, experiment was in 1990 when they treated somebody with severe combined immune deficiency. Um, but subsequently. Uh, it has been successfully used to treat inherited retinal degenerations, which we'll talk about in a minute. The most common, cause, uh, common virus that we use to deliver genes for gene therapy is called adeno-associated virus, or AAV. And AAV is very well suited for gene therapy. It doesn't cause disease in people. It doesn't cause much of an immune response, usually. It doesn't get into the host DNA. It's called episomal. It doesn't enter the DNA of the host, which sometimes could be uh, put somebody at risk for developing alterations in their normal DNA that could lead to problems or um, tumors. Um, and the only, the only problem with AAV is that it can only carry a certain amount of DNA, that, the transgene that we want to deliver. And the maximum capacity of AAV is about 4.7 kilobits kilobases. So it's really good for little genes, but is sometimes challenging to deliver larger genes, which also cause retinal degenerations. And then we sometimes have to look for alternative approaches to those types of diseases. Um, so current treatments that are using AAV um, are underway for patients who have um, RP65. And in fact, that has actually led to FDA approval and is no longer in research studies, but has is available for clinical care. Um, Choroideremia is currently being investigated as uh, treatable with AAV viral vectors. Different forms of age-related macular degeneration, hereditary optic neuropathy, excellent retinoschisis, and achromatopsia all are uh, under in investigated stages for um, delivery with AAV. And there probably are more that I'd left off that list. So how do you create a vector to deliver the transgene or the gene you're interested in? For example, a normal copy of the choroideremia gene. Well, the way we do it is uh, because we take two, the D AAV DNA has two parts of its DNA called open reading frames. One is called rep and one is called cap. Rep is really important to keep the uh, virus dividing and replicating. And cap is short for capsid. And there are a number of capsid proteins that form the package around the DNA. So if you want to deliver a particular transgene, you put the transgene in with the rep and the cap DNA so that you can package it up into this virus that will be able to replicate itself once it gets into the host cell, um, along with a helper adenovirus, which allows it to get into the cell in the first place. And then you get rid of the helper adenovirus and you're left with the transgene of interest inside a viral capsid ready for delivery to your cell of interest. So there's ways to make this better and optimize the viral vectors. Uh, a couple of different approaches have included rational design where you know what the viral transduction is and you try and tweak or modify or improve it by introducing changes to the package or the capsid or directed evolution. And this is a very interesting and effective approach of looking at lots and lots of different possible capsids and picking the ones that are most likely to be effectively delivered to the cells that you're interested in. So we'll talk about each of these one at a time. Rational design is an approach that once the, um, you approach you that uses modifications of the vector capsid of the AAV to improve the uh, with the amount of time that the, the vector survives within the cell um, by protecting it with ubiquitinization, which prevents it from being degraded, and then also introducing little changes that increase the amount of efficiency with which the vector gets into the nucleus and then turns on the protein of interest. So a couple little changes to the uh, AAV package can improve the survival and also the efficiency that the that the gene is delivered, with which the gene is delivered to the cell. Directed evolution um, has, been, has taken a non-biased, so totally um, agnostic approach where they just 
by sort of brute force, developed as many different variations to the capsid gene as they possibly could, millions and millions of different versions of the capsid gene. And then they put them into cells and placed them under pressure. So they delivered antibodies to try and recognize and eliminate them, and they changed the way they bound to receptors, and they identified the ones that survived the antibodies and got into the cells most effectively. And they picked the ones that were most successful and then amplified those and did several, several iterations to find a particular combination of proteins on the capsid that were especially effective at getting into cells, regardless of all the barriers that gene delivery faces. So directed evolution has been very successful in identifying new ways to deliver uh, gene therapy to eyes. But the most common way of delivery, there's sort of many different approaches to deliver this treatment to the retina. So one of the more common ones is by going under the retina with a sub-retinal injection. And I'll show you a little movie here. Oops, sorry, I need to go back. I'll show you a little movie here if I can. There it goes. Okay, I'm not sure how well this is uh, visible, but this is an example of Dr. K uh, administering through a tiny little hole in the retina um, an injection of a little bit of solution containing DNA through an adeno-associated viral vector underneath the retina of a patient. And I believe this, it says, is a patient who has not chordoremia, but a different disease called labor congenital amaurosis associated with a gene that is now available for clinical treatment called RPE65. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute, but the movie shows a creation of a tiny little hole and then uh, injection of fluid containing that DNA under the retina. And if you look very carefully, you can see the retina elevated to create a small little retinal detachment over where over which the DNA has been delivered. So in a perfect world, you would rather not detach the retina if you didn't have to. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. You might like to be able to deliver it into the eye without having to lift up the retina and put it in the place closest to the photoreceptors. So another approach is called intravitreal injection, where you just squirt the medicine into the eye, into the center of the eye, and you hope that it gets to the vision cells under the retina. And there are vectors designed through this directed evolution approach that I just mentioned on the previous slide that have been shown to be effective at finding their way from the center of the eye to the target cells of interest, whether that be the vision cells themselves, or the underlying retinal pigment epithelial cells. So those are two approaches. Most commonly, people do retinal detachment surgery, inject the treatment under the retina, um, but more recent, some recent studies have developed approaches that might be available intravitreally, which might cause less damage to the remaining fragile vision cells. Okay, now I'm gonna to talk to you about an example of successful development of gene therapy, which has really paved the way for different, you know, investigation into treatment for lots of other inherited retinal degenerations. So this is an example of a little boy, two and a half years old, whose eyes don't look steadily at things when he's trying to look at things. He has a disease or a condition called nystagmus, where the eyes move around a lot instead of holding still. It doesn't seem like he sees very well unless the lights are really, really bright. And he likes to look at bright lights and sometimes rubs on his eyes when he's uh, not in a place where there's a lot of light. Um, this is the a, a picture of his retinas and they look pretty unremarkable at the age of two and a half, but the patient was referred to me for testing and using an electroretinogram with little wires that allow us to measure the activity of the retina, we can see that this patient's retina doesn't respond well to dim light in the dark or to bright light, either in the dark or in the light, indicating that most of his vision cells are not responding well to light and, and convincing us that the reason that the vision is poor is because the vision cells are not responding to light. In this case, we call conge labor congenital amaurosis. So labor congenital amaurosis is a what we call it when someone has very early onset within the first year of life, severe vision loss caused by dysfunction of the vision cells themselves, the photoreceptors. 
And there are lots of different genetic causes of this disease. About 70% of the time, if we do genetic testing in people with labor congenital amaurosis, we can find a gene that is responsible. Um, most of these are inherited in autosomal recessive fashion, meaning that there is not, the DNA is not making a protein that is required. And you need two copies of a change in a gene that causes autosomal recessive disease. You need two changed copies to have a vision problem. But there are three forms of labor congenital amaurosis that are inherited in a way called autosomal dominant, where you only need one copy to be affected and the changed copy um, causes vision problems. Sometimes it's inherited from a parent or sometimes it's a brand new mutation in the child. And then that uh, has a chance of being carried on to the patient's children of about 50%. So I'm gonna talk about one genetic cause of labor congenital amaurosis, specifically because it forms a very nice example of how gene therapy can be developed and effectively delivered to patients. So RPE65 is a special case. It's pretty, very uncommon. It accounts for only about 7% of labor congenital amaurosis, which is in, an, in and of itself about five to 10% of all retinitis pigmentosa in the United States. The reason it's called RPE65 is because it is a gene that is specifically expressed in the RPE cells, the retinal pigment epithelial cells that live underneath the retina. And it plays a very important role in recycling um, a component of a relative of vitamin A that is necessary for vision. And if you don't have enough RPE65, patients have very poor vision, like the patient I just presented a minute ago, um, but the photoreceptors don't express this protein. So they stay intact for a long time. They exist, they're not intact, but they exist and are structurally present, although they're not working very well for many years. This is great because it gives us a lot of time to identify the problem and deliver a treatment. Um, and if you can deliver this missing protein, the vision cells are there to respond to the treatment and demonstrate improvements in vision. So a treatment called voretagene naparvovec was delivered, again, using an adeno-associated viral vector to package up this gene, RPE65, a normal copy of the gene. Um, and it was studied in a number of clinical trials. And the way they sh showed what happened in response to that treatment was that they used an obstacle course in different levels of light, and they call it a multi-luminance mobility course. And they showed that the eye, if patients had one eye treated and the other eye was blindfolded, they were much better able to get through this maze in the mobility course, in dim light especially, than when they covered up the treated eye and had them use their untreated eye, suggesting that their vision improved in response to the treatment. So this was, this mobility course was used to show that the treatment was not only safe, but effective in actually improving vision for people with this kind of inherited retinal degeneration that was treated with gene therapy. And then patients who received the treatment reported all kinds of other ways that their vision improved. Some people didn't have to use a cane. Some people began to be able to see details of faces that they had never seen before and see stars in the sky. I, that patient that I showed you a minute ago was treated at the age of three. And then the second I got treated at the age of 14, and he's actually able to drive a tractor <laughs> to plow a field on his grandfather's farm. So this is the same patient I was just gonna to talk to you a little bit more about. Same trial that I showed you at the age of two and a half is now here seen in this picture at 11 years of age. And so his right eye was treated um, at the age of six as part of a clinical trial of RPE65 gene therapy. And then the left eye got treated uh, at the age of 13 um, after this treatment was approved by the FDA. And now he sees very well. And as I mentioned, he loves to, uh, this is his retina in both eyes after treatment. And his favorite thing is to drive this tractor around on his grandfather's field. And so he's, you know, his vision's not perfect, but in a wide open field with no obstacles, he can actually help his grandpa do some farming. And that makes him very happy. Okay, so just briefly, RPE gene therapy, this uh, was the first randomized control phase three trial for an inherited retinal uh, inherited disease in all medicine that led to FDA approval for patients with biallelic RPE65 related early onset retinal degeneration back in 2017. And we are now currently able to give this to people on a clinical basis um, without a clinical trial. But lots of trials are underway. So people are investigating achromatopsia using uh, AAV under the retina, X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, and uh, chorderemia 
um, for using an AAV vector under the retina. ABCA4 for an autosomal recessive form of macular degeneration called Stargardt disease, uh, using a different kind of vector because that's a very big gene. Um, and similarly, myosin 7A for patients who have Usher syndrome, which causes congenital hearing loss and vision loss, using a subretinal lentiviral vector, big, uh, able to carry big genes. Um, and this has led everybody to be interested in, in having genetic testing, because to know whether or not you would be eligible for gene therapy, it's critical to know which genetic form of inherited retinal degeneration you have. So gene therapy is very exciting and holds the promise of really permanently altering the DNA in a way that would be helpful. But there are other approaches that uh, might be helpful for people whose D DNA is not necessarily a good fit for delivery through an adeno-associated viral vector. So you might be able, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt, but before you moved on, I did have one question for sure. Brent, and is it okay if I pause here okay. and ask that? Yep. Um, it's for subretinal injections. Uh -huh. Does it spread from the injection site to all the vision cells or is it limited to localized region of the actual injection? For example, the center of the retina or the areas where vision has disappeared. Thank you. Yeah. So subretinal injection is largely limited to the area of the delivery. So they call it the bleb, the area where the fluid lifts up the retina and delivers the treatment. Although there is probably a little bit of spread beyond the area that's detached. So they try very hard to deliver the treatment to the area where the vision cells remain. Gene therapy is not helpful in areas where no vision cells remain because there's no cells to take up the DNA and express it. So the goal is to deliver the treatment where there still are useful vision cells. And that means you have to, in that case, cause a detachment, which does sometimes cause potential damage to the remaining vision cells in order to get them to express the gene. Uh, delivery of that gene to places where the vision cells have all gone away is not likely to be helpful. So it is limited to the area where the treatment is delivered. And that is one of the limitations of subretinal delivery that might be overcome through an intravitreal approach that might allow for more widespread expression of the treatment. Perfect, that's good, thanks. Okay, should I continue? Sure. Okay. So other approaches include ways of modifying the DNA using antisense oligonucleotides. These are little nucleotides that can change the way the DNA turns into protein through a molecule called RNA. And this can sometimes uh, uh, improve protein expression when the DNA is not working correctly. Um, it could be used for both dominant or recessive diseases. Um, it's good for only specific types of mutations, though, that cause, uh, that could potentially be treated by skipping over them. And there are two clinical trials underway, one for a particular mutation in a particular region of the gene in H2A, exon 13, and a particular mutation in a gene called CEP290, which causes early onset retinal degeneration. And as we mentioned before, CRISPR gene editing is an exciting approach uh, that requires manipulation of the DNA um, in non-dividing cells using a guide RNA to find a very particular sequence. Usually this is used for uh, the most common mutation that causes disease in a particular gene. Um, and then identifying a specific sequence, cutting the DNA, changing the, mis the abnormal genes to a more normal sequence, and then pasting it all back together. And there are clinical trials underway uh, for USH2A and CEP290 for that, with that approach. I believe they're underway yet. I think they're in the planning stages. Okay, so as we mentioned before, the antisense oligonucleotides work by um, binding to the DNA and changing the way the DNA turns into protein. Um, and is really good for particular types of mutation, which cause pseudo -ex new exons to be expressed that shouldn't be. If you could skip over that mutation, you could have a more normal protein. Um, the good thing about them is they are delivered in the vitreous. They don't require a subretinal surgery, but the bad thing about them is they don't cause permanent changes. They have to be repeated on some amount of basis every few months to maybe even as long as every couple times a year. Okay, and as I mentioned before, gene editing is a really exciting approach that uh, led to Jennifer Doudna and uh, Emmanuel 
Charpentier, uh, receiving the Nobel Prize last year. So a um, very exciting approach that might have the ability to change uh, specific mutations, no matter how complicated the or large the DNA might be. If you can identify a specific sequence that uh, needs to be changed, you might be able to do that with this type of an approach. And as I mentioned, gene therapy is not just for inherited degenerations anymore. It's being used in more com uh, complex diseases and more common diseases like age-related macular degeneration, where they're using protein, they're using gene therapy to deliver proteins to keep blood vessels from growing under the retina. And they're using gene therapy to try and prevent vision cells from going away or dying in a form called dry AMD with geographic atrophy. But there's lots of challenges uh, with gene therapy. How should it be delivered? How long will it last? Do you want this to be permanent? Or like gene therapy offers permanent suppression. Do you want it to be permanent in AMD? That might cause unanticipated side effects in that, in that type of disease. Um, and it may put people at risk for other complications like new blood vessels growing under the retina. In addition, how much will it cost and uh, at what, for, for how long would the person benefit from that treatment? It's a little different if you're treating a three-year-old compared to treating a 90-year-old. Okay, and then let's talk a little bit about choroideremia, <laughs> like the interest, the area of interest that I know everybody on this call is dying to hear about. Uh, so let's talk a little more about choroideremia. So choroideremia is uh, also in clinical trials of gene therapy and other kinds of clinical trials as well. And one of the main challenge, one of the big challenges for developing treatments for choroideremia is being able to determine whether the treatment is safe and effective. And for patients with choroideremia, the visual acuity, which is something we often measure to determine whether something is working, uh, treatment is working well or not, um, it tends to be preserved for a long time. People don't lose vision early in disease. Usually they start by using losing night vision and then side vision, and then visual acuity is well preserved for a long, long time. Uh, a recent meta-analysis, which looks at many, many reports in the literature, looked at 23 clinical trials, uh, including over a thousand eyes of patients with choroideremia. And they observed that vision dropped in two phases. Initially, there was very slow loss of visual acuity until about the age of 39. After age 39, vision, visual acuity or numbers of letters that a person can read on a chart declined more rapidly. Uh, at a faster rate. And so it is important to, to know this because if clinical trials enroll patients who are younger than age 39, visual acuity is not going to be the thing that's going to change earliest. And they might need to use other kinds of measurements to know whether the treatment is helpful. So whenever a disease changes slowly over time, it represents a challenge to develop treatments for that disease. As I mentioned before, one of the most common ways we measure the effect of different diseases on vision is visual acuity and visual fields. And those tend to be very slow to change. Um, they're subjective measures that ask the patient to report what they're seeing. They're imprecise. They measure large amounts of retina before a measurable change can be detected. Sometimes they're not terribly reliable in patients with retinal degenerations because they can be influenced by other factors that aren't retinal, like, like cataract, like macular edema, like refractive error. All kinds of things can affect how well we can measure this type of response. So it'd be important for us to identify new, more sensitive and quantitative ways of measuring uh, changes in vision structure and function, uh, photoreceptor structure and function to help us develop treatments more quickly. So by combining lots of different ways of looking at the retina, we can probably learn more about retinal structure and function. And there's lots of different ways to look at how the retina is affected by inherited retinal degenerations. We can think about them in two categories, retinal structure, which measures the, how many cells still remain, and visual function, which measures how well they're working to help the person see. And you have to also kind of categorize which uh, stages of disease each of these tests might be most useful to study. So in early stages of disease, we can still see the vision cell as well using pictures of the retina called optical coherence tomography or OCT. Um, as that disease progresses further, and, and it, we can also use a technique called adaptive optics to look at the vision cells themselves. As the disease progresses further, we can still use the OCT for a, a certain amount of time, and we can also use a thing called fundus autofluorescence to measure the remaining retinal pigment epithelial cells, and that's very helpful in choroideremia. And then advanced stages of disease, 
the OCT is quite thin and we can still use the fundus autofluorescence. But if we think about how well the person can see, early in disease, visual acuity is measurable but not likely to change very fast. So instead, we often will measure visual side vision or visual field, and we call that perimetry. We can measure that in a topographic way, like uh, an island map or a hill of vision where the vision remains and where it's reduced. We can also measure rod function in the clinic by putting the person in the dark and then having them take a visual field test. As disease progresses, sometimes we, uh, sorry, can still measure visual fields, but we can often then measure non-localizing uh, or non-specific uh, area for, to a particular area of the retina tests, like a thing called full field stimulus testing, where we measure the most sensitive part of the retina's ability to respond to a blue, a red, or a white light in the dark to help us know whether the person still has any rod function remaining or if they're just using their cones at that point. And then later in disease, we have to rely upon things like asking the person how well they think they can see with a patient reported outcome, in addition to obstacle courses like the mobility test that was used for RPE 65 uh, approval. I'll just quickly talk a little bit about way, high resolution ways of looking at the vision cells. Adaptive optics uses a special technique that was initially designed for astronomy to help us see individual vision cells in the eyes of living people. Um, we can use two different approaches to look at the cones that have intact inner and outer segments, which look like little white dots in this picture on a confocal image and ones that discriminate or distinguish those from cells that only have remaining inner segments, which we use a split detector image um, to, to uh, identify. So by using these two methods together, we can understand how extensive the damage to the vision cells is and how many vision cells remain. And the, as I mentioned before, this is a common clinical measure. The optical coherence tomography um, allows us to see the retina inside view. And the retina looks like a multi-layered cake where we have different layers that do different jobs. The vision cells exist in the outer cell layers called uh, the outer nuclear layer where the vision cell bodies exist. There's a little band called the external limiting membrane and the inner segments where the machinery of the cell, the mitochondria live. And then there's a really bright band that we see on OCT called the ellipsoid zone where the inner and the outer segments connect. And that's really important for areas that remain visually active. That helps us identify how much vision structure exists that can still be responsive to light. And then we also have a band where the outer segments interact with the retinal pigment epithelial cells. We can look at that on side view with the OCT and on front view with adaptive optics and put that all together to understand how the vision cells are affected at different locations. So near the center, there's lots of cells remaining. And as we get farther away from the center in a patient with choroideremia, we see fewer and fewer of those cells remaining till an area uh, at the edge where we don't see any vision cells at all anymore. Um, fundus autofluorescence is a really effective way to measure health of the retinal pigment epithelial cells. It's a great measure in people with choroideremia because of the way the choroideremia progresses. You tend to see preserved islands of retinal pigment epithelium with this technique for a long, long time. Um, but it may not be uh, the only way to look at this uh, by, again, combining that with other kinds of approaches, we can get a lot more information about what's going on at each location. We can see areas of preserved retinal pigment epithelium with overlying retinal cells that are capable of vision in patients with choroideremia. And we combine that, we can combine that with adaptive optics to see what the vision cells look like at each of those locations and visual field measures using microperimetry to tell how well those, each of those regions can still see light. And some of our research has identified that that short, that autofluorescence image that shows where the retinal pigment epithelial cells exist may underestimate the number of remaining vision cells because sometimes using adaptive optics, we can see more vision cells than you would predict based on just the autofluorescence alone. And that might have important implications for determining where to deliver your gene therapy treatments for gene therapy treatment trials. Okay, and then it's also really precise measures of visual function using adaptive optics have shown that if you get out into some of these little strands where it looks like there still might be some cells, they may exist still, but they may not respond well to light. But if you could deliver gene therapy to these areas where the cells still exist, but they don't respond to light, those might be capable of improvements in vision. And we can show that the ability uh, that we can measure the vision, the 
Coronal perfusion, the blood perfusion under the retina corresponds really well to visual sensitivity. So measuring the blood flow under the retina is yet another measure that might be helpful to monitor in patients with choroideremia. Um, and we found that perfusion underneath the retina correlates really well with visual sensitivity or ability to see lights at different locations in patients with choroideremia. Here you see a slide that shows the best retinal sensitivity in areas where are in areas where the choroidal perfusion is best preserved. As we get to areas where the choroidal perfusion is very low, we also see a decline that goes along with that in their ability to see little flashes of light. Okay, so by combining adaptive optics optical coherence tomography, angiography, and micropermetry, we can use non-invasive ways to evaluate photoreceptors. Um, and we can identify the cone inner segments in areas of degeneration that might be useful in mo monitoring changes in structure, both during disease progression and in response to treatments. And by combining high resolution modalities like adaptive optics and OCT, and fundus autofluorescence and microfermetry, we can increase the sensitivity of each of those measures on their own. And it shows that there might be cells that might be amenable to treatment response, which are hard to see with some of our standard measures. Uh, we also found that even in places that look pretty normal and don't look like they're being affected in choroideremia, we can measure early changes in the blood perfusion under the retina, which suggests that might be an early measure, uh, that an objective early measure of perfusion that would be helpful to follow in patients with choroideremia. Okay, so what are some of the challenges of delivering gene replacement for patients with choroideremia? Well, first, most approaches have used a subretinal delivery, which requires uh, elevation of the retina that very delicate remaining vision cells um, have to be lifted up so that the cells, the treatment can get under them. And that might cause damage to the cells and might minimize the amount of improvement one would expect to see. So that leads to strong motivation to, for intravitreal delivery of gene therapy or antisense oligonucleotides. And there is currently a gene therapy clinical trial underway where they're using an intravitreal approach to deliver gene replacement for choroideremia. And the hope there is that it would be less damaging to the vision cells if the treatment could be effectively delivered to the place it needs to get to. So far, um, in the clinical trials of gene replacement for choroideremia that have so far been reported, about 20% of the people that have been treated have shown improvements in visual acuity, which is exciting, um, but that demonstrates that there's a big range of responses among different patients and probably different responses in different parts of the retina that are treated with the gene therapy. So certain parts of the retina may not get uh, elevated during retinal detach the detachment created used to deliver the treatment. And if the treatment doesn't get to the cells, uh, then it can't be effective in restoring vision. So it it's also would be helpful to look at patients who are older than 39 years of age to uh, monitor changes in vision. If they're younger than age 39, we might have to follow them longer to see changes in visual acuity. Um, and earlier outcome measures besides visual acuity might help us determine whether the treatment is effective in shorter periods of time. And since the rods are the earliest thing affected, it might be good to use dark adaptive visual fields or a technique called FST to measure the rods and the cones that they're most sensitive. And so far, treatments that have been reported have not shown clear reductions in the rates of loss of RPE cells, even though some patients have shown improvements in vision. So potentially it might require a combined approach where not only are you delivering the gene replacement, but you might also need to deliver some kind of neuroprotective neuro or immunomodulatory or antioxidant therapy to make the gene therapy work the best it can. So how close are we to retinal de to treating retinal degenerations like choroideremia with gene therapy? Well, we've already got an FDA approved treatment for one form of inherited retinal degeneration to be treated with gene therapy, which has paved the way for many, many other clinical trials, including choroideremia. Other approaches might be helpful, like antisense oligonucleotides, which can be injected into the vitreous and not require retinal detachment. And then gene editing might allow us to correct mutations in cells that aren't dividing, uh, which might be helpful for autosomal dominant degenerations or large genes that aren't currently amenable to delivery with a viral vector. And I'd like to thank all the funding sources that make this work possible. And I'd like to thank you for this kind of invitation to talk to you today. So now I'm happy to answer your questions.
<laughs> that was a whole lot to digest in 48 minutes. Oh my goodness, right? Um, we do have some questions. So let Please. me back up. Let, thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Should I stop sharing my screen? Um, sure, if you want to. I'm just going to have you be on there. And so then I can pay attention to the questions here. Here's the first one from Keith. He wants to know, does participation in a clinical trial preclude future participation in other clinical trials or clinical treatments once approved? That is a terrific question. And I'm so glad you asked it. You, when somebody is trying to determine whether or not to participate in a clinical trial, one of the most important things they should think about is the opportunity cost, because you're right. If you participate in a clinical trial of a treatment that affects the DNA or that involves cells like stem cells or other kinds of cellular therapies, it likely does prevent you from being in other clinical trials. Mm -hmm. it, pro it may or may not prevent you from eventually receiving a treatment that was approved by the FDA. So if you have already been exposed to a gene edit, gene modifying treatment, it is not clear whether additional treatment, a different gene modifier within that same eye would be a good idea. Your other eye would probably be, so for example, the patient I showed you got gene therapy in one eye as a clinical trial and the other eye after the treatment was approved. So the other eye could be available for treatment or eligible for treatment, but it's true that if you, you have to be very careful before you decide to participate in a trial that involves modification of the DNA or cells, because it probably will prevent you from being in other trials in the future. That's really super good to know. Um, all right, here's one from Brent. If there are outer strands of living cells, would multiple subretinal injections be required to treat each? You're nodding your head, I see that. For yeah. example, left, he gives an example quickly. For left side upper area and some central might require three injections. If so, would the three take place during the same event or three separate surgeries? Yeah, okay. so. I do not know of anybody that has done repeat injections or repeat surgeries in people. It's a great question because people wonder whether the, there's, so there is evidence in some of the RP65 trials, not the one that got approved by the FDA, but some of the other ones that were investigated, that the treatment effect declined over time. It was really good at the beginning and then it was not as good later as it was at the very beginning. So people have wondered whether going back in and treating again would be a good idea. And as far as I know, that hasn't been attempted yet. So for, for the time being, I think if you get a subretinal injection of gene therapy, the thought is that it is a one-time thing. Uh, if they don't treat the area that like, I do know that during the time of treatment, sometimes they will create more than one bleb, which means that they'll deliver the DNA in one spot and then they'll move over and also deliver it in another spot. Uh, not so much for cordyremia, where usually there's just one little location in the center that they're trying to treat. Um, but sometimes the treatment doesn't go quite where they want it to go, and so they'll move to a different location. But I don't know of anybody that's gone back in and done another administration of gene therapy to the same eye on a subsequent surgery. Good to know. You know, you just, there, there's another question here, and you definitely spoke on this, but I want to make sure um, I ask it in its entirety. Um, Yamal asks and says, hello, um, uh, is it possible or problematic to have an intravitreal injection generic treatment after having a subretinal injection treatment? This question is assuming the subretinal injection treatment gets the FDA approval before the latter. So interested in knowing if it is possible to combine them in the future. Okay, so I'm just trying to unpack what the question included. So is it theoretically that the subretinal injection was specific for the gene and the intravitreal was a non-specific? You said generic uh, treatment. Are they both meant to be gene-specific gene augmentation approaches? <laughs> I don't know. don't know. Okay. Well, I think uh, similarly, I think if you get treated with a subretinal injection, you probably wouldn't be a candidate for intravitreal injection. I think once one eye gets treated with DNA modification, uh, it's 
probably the case that that eye wouldn't be treated again. I didn't get into this very much uh, because intravitreal seems really promising, but the concern with intravitreal, although it might be more widespread and less likely to damage the retina, is that it may be more likely to cause inflammation in the eyes. And so if somebody has a disease where they don't make a protein, for example, cordyremia, and you have a mutation in your DNA such that you have from birth, not made a normal copy of the corduromia gene. And then somebody gives you gene therapy and you start making that gene. If they then give you another version of DNA to make that gene, now your body might recognize that as a foreign protein and might mount an immune response. So the thought so far has been repeat treatments of the same eye have not been undertaken to my knowledge because there's worries that there will be inflammatory responses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, here's another one. This is from Ed. For people with strong visual acuity, which, as you said, is very um, common for CHMers, right? Do you anticipate future trials for these people? To date, I've been told that my vision is, quote, too good to have gene therapy, which is really a challenge for many of us. Understood. Yeah, no, it's true. And patients, yeah. So corduremia and a couple of other diseases are similar in that they spare the fovea for a long, long time. And so I realized that, you know, your vision, even though you can see a lot of letters on the chart is not as useful to you as you wish it would be. Um, and that you would more than anything rather have improved vision than you have right now. The concern is until we are sure the treatment is likely to be safe, it is worrisome to, to deliver an experimental treatment to somebody who still has the ability to read small letters. We worry that our treatment is gonna take away that remaining vision that you have. So I think, yes, yeah, someday that once we show this is a safe treatment, that you would be a great candidate. You may be the best kind of candidate because you might be the person who's most likely to benefit from this kind of a treatment. But until we're sure it's gonna not harm you, we're not eager to potentially damage those remaining cells that are allowing you to still use that vision to see small letters. So that's the balance that we're trying to strike between risk and benefit. And as soon as we can show in people who have less remaining vision that the treatment isn't harmful, then they tend to move down into people who have better and better levels of remaining vision, because those are the people that are most likely to respond well and benefit from the treatments. You know, you've been doing this a long time, Dr. Duncan. Is there a, you know, that time frame, how long do we wait to see if it's safe? Yeah, well, most uh, industry sponsors, most companies that are making these treatments, they don't want to wait forever. So they don't usually want to have a treatment trial go more than a couple of years. The challenge, though, is that that may not be long enough to show whether something's effective. So they're in it as fast, you know, to go as fast as they can while making sure that it's not going to be harmful. Um, gene therapy trials require participants to remain engaged by phone for 15 years. So we don't know what the long-term consequences might be. And you're right, you know, you could wait forever, but I'll tell you that no company wants to wait more than a couple of years. So they usually wait about three months after one person is treated before they're willing to go into another person or increase the dose. So they don't wait too long, honestly but they continue to follow people over time to look for sides, uh, signs of long-term side effects. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry about the pings here, guys. Um, I have another, another message. Um, does the body recognize receipt of the DNA corrections in one eye and eventually spreads the benefits to the non-treated eye or is gene therapy theoretically limited to one treated eye? Yeah, I wish that would work that way. You're, and it's an excellent question because corduremia, the gene... CHM gene is expressed in every cell. So you would think that if you could um, deliver it, maybe somehow it would be effective in a long-term, long, widespread way. But it, unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's the case. And the reason is when someone asked earlier about when you deliver the treatment, how widespread does the treatment go? Um, the eye is a very sort of a protected part of the body. It's kind of sequestered from the rest of the body, which is good because it prevents uh, inflammatory things from getting into the eye or immune responses from causing damage in the eye. But it is kind of bad in that the treatments we put in the eye aren't likely to spread to the other eye. In fact, the treatments don't often spread beyond the area where the treatment is delivered if it's in the subretinal space. So um, unfortunately, I think only one eye gets the benefit of the treatment um, that is delivered. 
Brent just said, thank you. That's what I thought. Well, I think you're right. <laughs> you know, I think let's just give it one more minute. Any final questions, type them in quick. Uh, but I think that's it. Is there anything else that you think as an organization or members of the CRF that we can do to just support, engage? Um, I know uh, the foundation itself, um, we certainly are doing all that we can do um, to have a robust SAB. We have monthly science advisory board meetings, um, research committee meetings. Um, but is there anything else that you would recommend that we do from the grassroots? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the only experience from which I speak is with um, Foundation Finding Blindness, who's just been around longer. Um, and they really, as, as does the Cordoba Research Foundation, benefit from the expertise of a very strong and very engaged scientific advisory board. And that really makes all the difference in the you know rigor with which this very, uh, the proposals are reviewed, you know, this, everybody feels a very strong obligation to be really wise and careful and judicious stewards of the hard earned funds that you have, like everybody appreciates that it is awfully hard to raise money and we want to make every penny go as far as it possibly can. So I think engagement with your scientific advisory board is really important. Um, and having to the extent possible, uh, the, you know, understand that you don't want to limit the the pace at which research proceeds, to have sort of regular cycles of calls for applications so that all the applications can be compared head to head one to another, um, I think provides for a really robust process where you end up identifying the most pr promising proposals that are really rigorously um, evaluated and assessed so that you pick the very best ones that are gonna be most likely to yield um, important, important observations. Uh, that that, that can sometimes work. Um, just a thought. That's superior. That's great. You know, it's very reassuring. And I, I'm sure I can say this on behalf of the rest of the folks that are on board today and that will be watching um, in the future. We're really grateful and really grateful to the work that you and your team have done. Um, you've, you've been involved in several different institutions from down in Florida to um, with the um, the Shea I Institute, just everywhere. We just wanna just thank you very much for your dedication to our little rare disease. Um, oh, we're, we're really grateful. Yeah, no, I, I feel uh, the same urgency and passion and motivation to make you know make things different and better for patients than they are today. So, you know, kudos to CRF for continuing to advance the cause and to support, raise funds that support the research um, with sort of a, unidirectional focus. Um, and I think, you know, I have been doing this now about 20 years and, uh, you know, we're still, it's still not the way it ought to be. It's not, we still don't have treatments for most people, um, but we're a lot, we know so much more than we used to know. And the enthusiasm and energy and interest in this field has expanded just really exponentially in recent years and partly due to the success of gene therapy for RP65. So I think that really has led to a lot of people being interested in this space. Um, and so I think we should, we are in a position to really capitalize on, on that progress um, and make really uh, even better develop uh, progress, better gains and an, our understanding and development of treatments going forward. Perfect. I think we're going to end it there. Okay. So, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank Have you. a wonderful, I hope California is nice and warm. Beautiful um, today here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks everybody for joining us and want to thank you again, our sponsors, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Thanks.